Okay then, let's get going. Uh, I was talking to you yesterday about uh, how there was this whole uh, movement for the separation of the Imperium and the Sacerdotium, which unfortunately gets translated as the church state controversy. Okay, and the partisans of the Imperium, they are also called the partisans of the state. Uh, the state, as I keep mentioning, is a modern institution. It's a post Machiavellian institution. And uh, perhaps it is something that begins with the social contractualists, the state as we know it and the way in which we should understand it. Anyway, so, but in your exam, please write it as church state controversy. And then there's no problem. If you write imperium, sacerdotium, they just might get confused. This is to give you the correct information, but for purposes of uh, examination, call it church state. Anyway, so Niccolo Machiavelli is one of the most important figures that uh, we have to study. Uh, and he came at a time when Christianity was declining. Okay. And uh, are you able to hear me? Because my voice yes, is not very, yeah, my voice is not very good. I'm still not feeling well, but I want okay. If you're here able to follow me, it's okay. So if you look at uh, uh, the 15th and 16th century Italy, uh, this was the time when it was teeming with uh, revolt against the church. And there were a number of people uh, who were talking about how the church was a corrupt institution. And this was the time in which Niccolo Machiavelli existed. Okay. And he belonged to the city-state of Florence. Now, the Italian city-states, unlike the Greek city-states, can be called city-states. But please remember that these city-states are slightly different from the city-state which was Geneva during the time of Rousseau. I will talk about that when we talk about Rousseau. And it is completely different from the city-states that we have today. Uh, one of the most well-known city-states is uh, Singapore. And another very, very well-known uh, city-state is Monaco, M-O-N-A-C-O. Okay, and in fact, Monaco also has the densest population in the whole world. It's a tax haven. People, all the rich and the famous live there. Okay, uh, so it's a great place, apparently. Anyway, so now, so but we can call them city-states, these ones. We don't have to look for another word for it. Now, Machiavelli was essentially a historian first and foremost. And later on, he became a philosopher as well. And at some point in his life, he also became a diplomat. His best known work uh, he is best known for his work, uh, The Prince or Il Principe in Latin. 
okay this is his best known work this is what everybody studies when they study Mac machiavelli now his other famous work which is not as famous as the prince is actually called discourses on the first 10 books of titus livius and this is also just called discourses and sometimes it's called discourses on livy livius was shortened to livy and in italian they also write it as discorsi d o s c o r s i discorsi the livy d e l i v y discorsi the livy is what it is also written as but it will be fine if you call it just the discourses okay it will be absolutely okay if you call it just the discourses people will understand titus livius was a practicing a practicing philosopher okay he also had some connections with diplomatic offices and he was also somebody who wrote a lot about governance but i am not going to go into those details now we don't have the liberty now if you basically look at machiavelli machiavelli had started writing the discourses first okay and while he was i don't know how much extent he went into uh, uh, the writing of the discourses but he kind of stopped writing the discourses in order to write the prince so it might surprise you as to why is it that he was going uh, why did he stop writing the discourses and why did he start writing the prince? The answer for that is actually quite simple. Uh, what you will see when you look at uh, uh, Machiavelli is that he saw that there were a number of people uh, who were writing a book called The Prince because this is the time when the partisans of the Imperium or the partisans of the state as people like to call it not the correct translation but we have to live with it so these people uh, had made a very lasting impression upon uh, philosophers who were coming into being including those like Titus Livius and then among those many people who were writing uh, a book called The Prince where they wanted to have a prince ruling please remember nobody was yet called kings at that time and the prince when we look at the prince we see the prince as a king in waiting okay elizabeth the queen of elizabeth the second the queen of england refuses to die though she is 95 and her son is still prince charles so he's some 75 or something like that okay and uh, so he's like a king in waiting but that is not the kind of prince that we talk about. The prince here is a ruler of a principality. City-states were ruled by these people. So many people were trying to write books uh, which were some kind of an advice to be given to the different princes who were ruling the different city-states of Italy. Okay. Now, at this time, there was one person whose name was Gucciardini. 
जी यू आई सी सी आई ए आर डी आई एन आई कची आर डी नी ऑल्सो थॉट ही विल राइट अ बुक कॉल्ड द प्रिंस एंड ही वॉज नॉन टू मैक वैली एंड बिकॉज ऑफ गुची आर डी नीज इन्फ्लुएंस मैक वैली डिसाइडेड टू स्टॉप राइटिंग द डिस्कोर्सेस एंड राइट अ बुक कॉल्ड द प्रिंस Now Machiavelli had an agenda. For him, he wanted the unification of the various sit- Italian city-states, states under the rule of one prince. Okay, so even though at that time the concept of the nation-state had not yet fully come into being machiavelli was one of the first people to try and attempt to create a nation state a nation state nation is a feeling on oneness feeling of oneness okay so he was trying to create a nation state of sorts but not a democratic nation state but one ruled by a prince right so he wanted to unify all these different city states like florence milan naples uh, rome all these various italian city states he wanted to unify and put them under the rule of one particular prince now he wrote this book if you look at the prince it's a very very small book it's an extremely small book it is hardly 80 pages and it is very small it's not even a big book in size and uh, what he thought was that uh, he will basically try to dedicate this book to one of the existing princes dedicate the book and present it to him and say please follow this advice that i have written in this book so the medici family were actually uh, they just came into power before that machiavelli tried to become a ruler himself this is a very little known fact so he put a, together an army of common people and peasants trained them okay people of florence he trained them to become warriors and he was also successful in uh, defeating another city state called pisa p i s a you must have heard of the leaning tower of pisa it's like this it's slanted so pisa was another city state like florence he in fact managed to defeat them okay and uh the then he was trying to do something and at that particular time the medici family uh, actually came into power okay at that time it came into power and so he made a dedication of uh his work which was uh the prince to the ruler of the medici family whose name was lorenzo the medici okay Lorenzo the Medici he made a dedication to him but Lorenzo the Medici was not very very impressed and after some time they were ousted from power till then Savonarola was their head of the chancery okay and Savonarola himself actually has a big role as a diplomat we cannot discuss that 
if we do the course properly, then we will be able to discuss it, but we don't have the time. So Savonarola was also assassinated. And at that time, uh, Machiavelli was given not the head of the chancery, but the role of the second chancellor of the chancery of Florence. He was given this role. That is how he became a diplomat. And the sports are anytime, please remember when a Z is written in Italian, uh, Z, Z, or just Z, you don't read it as Sforza. You read it as Sforza, like T Z A. Okay. So he then tried to dedicate the prince, the work to the Forza family. That also didn't uh, work out because the Sforza were not interested in conquests. Uh, this I have already explained. Uh, Machiavelli once again tried to put an army together. But by then, another thing had happened, which was there was a big rise in the number of mercenary soldiers. So who are mercenary soldiers? Mercenary soldiers are the ones who work for money. They don't have loyalty to anyone or anything. You pay them money, they'll work for you. So when he tried to reconsolidate an army again, okay and try to do something about it this time he failed miserably because a lot of people were mercenaries had turned mercenaries and they wanted a lot of money which he couldn't give and therefore that army idea fell apart now the prince itself at that time came under very severe criticism the prince as in the book it came under very severe criticism for its pragmatism. See, pragmatism can be used positively and negatively. When you use it as a philosophical school, which you find in America, okay, of which people like John Dewey and Richard Rorty are members, then pragmatism has, doesn't have a bad meaning. But otherwise, pragmatism is considered to be something which is based in opportunism, okay? And it is also something which is based in, people will say practical outlook, but in the name of practical outlook, people do various bad things, okay? So pragmatism is not considered to be a good thing until and unless it is applied to the American philosophical school, right? So because of it being an opportunist book, because he said a number of things, we'll come to that uh, shortly. Uh, the book came in for very, very severe criticism. The church, of course, was livid. The church was extremely angry because they thought he was trying to undermine the authority of the church completely, totally. And therefore, they said, let's burn this book. And this book was burned. Many, many copies of that book were burned. Now, when people describe Machiavelli, I don't know what is your source that you are following. You are likely to come across these terms, okay? People use these expressions that Machiavelli was a classical realist, which is as opposed to the 20th century realism. People say that he was a classical realist and some say he was anti-idealist, right? Now, why do people say that? say that because of one reason. 
I told you once, all philosophy is considered today to be a footnote to Plato, right? I told you that. I hope you remember it. Now, if you go by that, you will see that both Plato and Aristotle were seen as people who were who had an imaginary, abstract imaginary idea of the ideal kind of society and the ideal kind of governance in that in a polis. So as opposed to that kind of idealism, uh, Machiavelli was a realist. He didn't want to have good. He didn't want to have the moral. So they say he is a realist, but that is not true. It is not at all true. It, so please do not use the term classical realist. The term anti-idealist doesn't apply at all. Okay. Some say that his style of writing used, uh, I mean, he used the style of writing, which is called speculum. In literature, when people talk about speculum, speculum is nothing but mirror. We discussed this when we were doing, uh, I didn't use the word speculum then, but when we were talking about the attributes of Western political philosophy, I had talked to you about the fact that one of the things is that people believed that philosophy should be the mirror image of reality. Okay, so some people say that his realism is based in this speculum or the mirror image. The speculum is the mirror image. But that too is wrong because he is imagining a society or rather he's imagining the formation of a new kind of a political organization by bringing together all the <coughs> All the city states, all the city states of Italy. So he was also imagining. Okay, so he's not anti idealist, he's not a realist, and that's known, that's not a mirror because there was no question of all these things being united. So that should also be considered as wrong, the idea that it is a speculum, okay? Now, however, the contention that is made by some of his interpreters, uh, where they say that this was some kind of an advice to rulers about how one can rule successfully. That interpretation is sustainable and it is correct. What he was doing was actually trying to give people a handbook of governance or a manual of operations for princes. It has all kinds of do's and don'ts. It is something like what Chanakya did it's not exactly like that. Please don't make a comparison and say he is like Janakya. No, he's not like Janakya, and we don't even know if Janakya is one person or it is three persons. Is Janakya Kautilya, Vishnu Gupta? Is it the same person or are these three different people? We don't know. Okay, so that again, please put it away. He, this work has been called a work of humanism. And this is absolutely correct. What is humanism? Please remember that you have to differentiate between humanit 
libertarianism and humanism. If there is a flood somewhere, or if there is a famine somewhere, and people are suffering, if you send them aid in the form of food, in the form of clothes, in the form of whatever useful things that these people require, that becomes humanitarian. But humanism is the belief in the idea that the human being is capable of doing great things. That is the idea that you find in Machiavelli in the prince. In the prince, he is basically trying to tell the prince that you can do a lot of things. Okay? So, it is a humanist work. And he's completely ignoring the church. He doesn't say a word against the church, by the way. He doesn't say the church is this, is that, it is this. No. All that he does is ignores the church as if it doesn't exist. And that is what rankled the church most. That here we are, this huge, wonderful institution, and we are being ignored. So they couldn't take that. So you find that there is this particular idea that the human being is capable of higher things. If you look at a quotation from a Renaissance thinker called Alberti, Alberti said, God created man in his own image endowed him with intelligence that no other living creature is capable of and has given him the strength to tame a thousand wild horses. That is a statement of humanism. Okay. This was made by an Italian whose name was Alberti, A-L-B-E-R-T-I, not Alberti, Alberti. He made this. There was another one called Bruni, B-R-U-N-I, who was also a humanist. And funnily enough, there are two people from the Christian church in Netherlands. And these are also humanists. One is Desiderius Erasmus and the other one is Ulrich Zwingli. Okay, I'm sure you did this in your school social studies. We did this, I remember. So, Zwingli and Erasmus. Otherwise, do a search and you'll find. Though they were Christian pastors, they were pastors but they believed in the human potential. So that shows changing attitudes towards church and people from within the church. But people like Erasmus especially did not give support to Machiavelli. Okay? Because they believed that humanism is not necessarily ruling with an iron fist or an iron hand. Okay. Machiavelli said a ruler in order to be successful has to rule with an iron fist or an iron hand. Subjugate people to laws. Create a legal system. He talked about codification of laws. He went back to Cicero. He went back to Cicero, who was the one who tried to create a codified system of laws. Okay, and he said, we should have a codified system of laws and everybody should bend their head in front of the laws. And it is the duty of the prince to rule with the iron hand and draw compliance to those laws 
from all the people. He said, love and compassion won't get a ruler anywhere. Okay? Because different people like different things. And he said, a ruler cannot cater to all the different things that exist in the world, to all the different likes and dislikes that people have within a particular principality. So he simply said, don't rule with this whole thing called love and compassion. It doesn't work. If you have to make it work, you have to rule with a complete iron hand. And he also believed that ends justify means. What does that mean? Ends are your goals. Now, if you believe in morality, okay, if you believe in morality, then you will say that I may have a goal, but I will not break my moral code in order to reach that goal, which is what Gandhi did in India. He said, Satyagraha, Ahimsa, these are our moral codes and we should basically be ruling, uh, I'm sorry, fighting for our independence by following these. But if you say ends justify means, you want to become rich, go and rob a bank. If you rob a bank and you become rich and you're not caught, you're fine. That's what it means. So he was called a preacher of evil by Leo Strauss. Leo Strauss is himself a philosopher and a scholar of other philosophers. Leo Strauss said he's a preacher of evil, Machiavelli. But Quentin Skinner is a lot more charitable. Okay, Quentin Skinner says that one should look at the prince as an experimental work. And this experiment is being conducted by using a method called the method of logical abstraction. What Machiavelli is trying to do is to understand how to rule by removing society out of it. Okay, you'll understand this better when I come to Hobbes because Hobbes also uses exactly this method. When he talked about politics, when Machiavelli talked about politics, he excluded society completely, abstracted society out of it. So, this is a state or a principality without a society. Just a principality. There's no society there. Okay. So this people have said is a claim to his being a modern thinker. But he was not a modern thinker. He's a proto-modern thinker. Proto comes from prototype. Before you create an actual product, you create prototypes, various prototypes. You test them. And when you know that this is going to work, then you put the final thing out. Okay? So he's not a complete modern thinker, but he has laid the seeds and the foundation of modernity. So... He is a proto-modern thinker. And he was successful in separating the Imperium and the sacred routine. He separated them completely. Okay. And with... How did he achieve this? Okay. How did he really achieve this? This is the question. And the answer to this is that he achieved this 
by doing what the partisans of the imperium or the partisans of the state couldn't do, which was separating ethics from politics. making politics devoid of ethics and morality. Okay, they couldn't do that. When they were asked on what basis will somebody become a prince of the Imperium, they said by divine right. And then the church said, if, why, if God is the one who's giving a right, he's giving it to the Pope. Why should you have another prince? No need, thank you. That's why they failed. Machiavelli caught that. That's why he doesn't acknowledge the sacred otium, doesn't acknowledge God, doesn't acknowledge anything to do with the church. And he removed all ethics from politics. So that ends justify uh, means is something which is a part of this logical abstraction experiment, which he did in order to separate ethics from politics. And because of that, there is a re-emergence of the political realm of activity, which had disappeared in the medieval period. Okay, the political realm of activity came back to life. Now, Machiavelli is not against God, but he's against the Christian church and the Christian idea of God. Even in the prince, towards the end, there is one, one time only where he mentions God, where he says, Italy beseeches some unknown God to give it a prince who has the power to unify all the city-states. He says this towards the end of uh, the uh, uh, prince. That's the only time he talks about God in that work. Okay, so he was basically against this whole idea of uh, you know, um, he, he, he was totally against uh, this idea of having uh, God interfering in temporal matters. Now, Machiavelli talks about two things called Virtu and Fortuna. Uh, can I ask you something? Can I put a link again and finish this topic today? Yes, sir. Others? Quickly, quickly tell me. Hmm? Okay. I don't think the others want me to finish. I uh, don't want me to put a link again. No, sir. No, sir. Please continue, sir. No, I'll have to put a link again because it says I have only two minutes and 40 seconds. I want to finish this. Okay. That is the reason why. So, I'll pick this up about Machiavelli, Virtu and Fortuna. I'm putting a link now. I'm scheduling a meeting immediately. Okay. And please log in immediately. Okay, thank you. Yeah.